Great. So welcome to this week's Tonko Cast. We had a actually really pleasant visit from a surprise visit mm -hmm. from uh, someone we've been following for a while, um, but our first time, Mark Osborne, the director of The Little Prince. Yeah. So the movie comes out actually today on Netflix. This is such a long-awaited, uh, anticipated film for a lot of us in the community. It came out in France and Japan and some other countries, but the U.S. release kind of got delayed, and finally, this movie comes out today. Yeah, yeah so, so excited! I've been waiting for so long to mm -hmm. be able to watch it in the states. So, yeah, we're really excited to share Mark. I apologize; I actually didn't get to spend much time with Mark. We had to kind of draw straws, and one of us had to take a meeting. Meanwhile, Mark was uh, available. So. Uh, you were very fortunate to... I mean, a uh, lot of our friends Mark. worked on it. He talked about like a Chris Applehans and Peter DeSev and, you know, Lou Romano. Like a lot of people worked on... A lot of our friends worked on this film and were so envious because it's such a special project. So enjoy. Uh, it's so re really incredible to have you here at Tonko House. Just totally dream come true. and. Congratulations, the Little Prince is coming out in the U.S. Yeah, yeah. this week. Yeah, thanks. I know I'm happy to be here. It's nice to finally be able to visit and uh, meet you in person. And I've uh, been a huge fan of, of your work, and I love the Dam Keeper so much. And Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm happy we can make it work. Yeah, It's, it's such a, an amazing film. A lot of people in this community have been waiting for the wide release you know, yeah. so long. Kind of backing up because, you know, Mark, when you started this project, you contacted me a couple of times, you know, to say, hey, like, maybe there's a way we can collaborate or, you know, like you were, I think you were at the time still in Paris and... Um, yeah, I was looking, um, I was using the book, the power of the book to try mm -hmm. to draw as many, you know, great artists to join the project. And so I could get my foot in the door with the book and um, I had... You know, I was a fan of your work, but I saw the little, um, you did that beautiful little mood piece that was about sketch, sketch travel, travel. Mm -hmm. and, and I just, it was so, um, I don't know, it just had, it had the feel of what we were trying to do with the Little Prince in a way, you know, and anyway, so that was why I was like. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I remember feeling so uh, humbled and honored that you kind of reach out to me. I mean, you, uh, you, because I only knew you from Crew for Panda. Yeah. And I, I was like, oh, I didn't know Mark left DreamWorks. And, you know, like Little Prince is, like, like you said, it's, it's, a, it's a book for everybody, I feel like. You know, everybody yeah. grew up with that book. Yeah. And it's such a powerful book. Uh, even though I was still at Pixar, kind of in the middle of big projects, I seriously considered, I remember, you know, just, oh my God, I gotta, I gotta do this project somehow. Um, but m my question is like, how did you kind of directing this blockbuster, big Hollywood animated film to, this is more of a like indie, yeah. you know, yeah. how, what the transition was like and what made you decide to leave a big studio? Well, I was always an indie filmmaker in the beginning. And when I started exploring animation and got interested in it and I applied to CalArts, I was applying as a transfer student and so my only option was the experimental animation department and I never realized what a good fit that was going to be for me because I, I was kind of falling in love with animation but I didn't really understand yet the whole universe that w existed of animation and so <laughs> I got into the experimental department and started exploring all different kinds of filmmaking and got really interested in stop motion in particular but I don't know, I really, I was, I admired the films that, that, um, the film that spoke to me the most was Balance. You yeah, remember Balance? I remember that. That one made me go, yeah. oh my God, like it blew my mind, but I was already like a fan of both, um, the Quay Brothers, mm -hmm. Jan Svankmeyer, I was really, I loved Ardman, like Creature Comforts had just come out, and it was like, you know, there was all this great material that I was inspired by mm -hmm. and so I think when I started to think about short films I was thinking in terms of you know um, like balance in particular it was sort of felt like I don't know it was so it has that same feeling that that short you got nominated for right, right. Yeah. It, it was just I think it inspired me a lot because it was it wasn't gigantic mm -hmm. production value it was just like kind of it was smart and it was I don't know it felt it it, it was inspiring so 
so anyway, so my shorts and the stuff I was doing, was, I was just looking to try to figure out how to make films. I was looking how to do something interesting. And eventually, I was actually trying to raise money for a feature that was kind of in the same vein as Moore. Um, so after the success of Moore, I was trying to develop this feature, trying to raise money, and I found it really, really difficult. Um, and I had friends that were working at DreamWorks, and so I went and applied at DreamWorks. And they, on the strength of more, they brought me in as sort of like a director in training almost. Mm. So I went in to gain experience. I never expected to gain as much experience as I did. I never expected to, you know, um, have my weird, you know, point of view and my, you know, sort of approach be um, something that would end up helping mm -hmm. and, and clicking with, with, with the, the way they were making films. But it was a really great moment. Kung Fu Panda was really unique and we had this great opportunity and in in some ways i feel like yeah it's a big huge movie but but um i do think i don't know i always felt like i was treating it like it was an independent film in a way and i was really trying to bring sort of my um what was important to me about the movie the mm -hmm. the, the story it was really kind of fighting for that all along and so after that was over my wife reminded me that you know, I didn't have to stay. She was kind of, you know, because it was sort of like this big moment of decision of like, what do I do next? And because it was successful, I really felt like I could then take that success and help maybe get my stop motion feature off the ground or I could get, you know, I really, I wanted to try to use that and use what I had learned and try to do, and you know, at that time I even said to, to, to the powers that be at DreamWorks, I said I wanted to do smaller projects that I could have more creative control so I could do something that would be maybe a little bit weirder than, mm -hmm. than the giant tentpole movies. And um, they said we would love it, but they said our business isn't that right now. And they said it might be that someday, but it can't be that right now. And so I really went out looking elsewhere and didn't know what I would find, but eventually, um, you know, um, I developed all different kinds of things and then eventually I got asked if I knew The Little Prince. And I never imagined, I mean I said no at first because I knew the book, I knew the book so well mm -hmm. I said you can't turn it into a movie. And mm -hmm. but, but the more I thought about it I realized that it was kind of this weird sort of perfect um, opportunity to make a very very personal film in a way mm -hmm. and to kind of return back to my indie roots while, while bringing the experience that I had at the big studios because we were really trying to make something that would straddle both worlds and be something quite different as mm -hmm. far as animated features go. Wow. The, the movie, The Little Prince, definitely has a lot of sort of a personal perspective because, you know, it's a main character who's reading the book, mm -hmm. just like the rest of us mm -hmm. who grew up reading the book. Is that like... Is that how you brought your personal perspective to it? Like, you know, who, who came up with that sort of version? Well, I knew the book was important to me, mm -hmm. like it is to so many people, because of the relationships that develop around the book. Mm -hmm. And for mm -hmm. me in particular, my wife gave me the book way back when we were just dating in college. And when she gave me the book, she wanted me to have her copy and she wanted me to have it because we were going to actually have a long distance relationship. It was right at the time where I was leaving New York to go to Cal Arts, mm. and I didn't want to be separated from her and she didn't want to either. But she said she would like quote from the book and say, mm -hmm. you know, it is only with the heart that one can see rightly what is essential is invisible to the eye. And she would say, you know, we'll always be together even if we're apart. And it was like this incredible support at a time that I really needed it. And then the book became a connection between us and the wisdom in the book, not only about relationships, but and love and dealing with loss and, you know, but also, um, That's beautiful. yeah, the book helped me sort of connect to my artistic self from when I was a seven year old kid. Mm -hmm. And it, and it helped me a lot on my path of trying to figure out what I was doing. Mm -hmm. But, um, so I, that's how I knew the, the book resonated in my life mm -hmm. and, I think that was one of the earliest sort of thoughts was that, you know, we actually had to not only just adapt the book, but we had to find a way to create a movie that would um, celebrate the power of the book in, yeah. in, in someone's life. And, and so the, all these things started to emerge and these ideas kind of came from this very long process of just really contemplating what this could be. And the idea of using a little girl who, you know, is very much inspired by my daughter mm -hmm. um, you know the idea of using a little girl to then 
be the one that we experienced the book with, that became the perfect way to protect the book. It's we, we let the book live in her imagination just like it lives in our imagination. Mm -hmm. And then that way, you know, it was a way to, you know, we weren't making a, we weren't making, we weren't putting the book up on the screen and saying, this is the book. Mm -hmm. We're saying this is her interpretation of right. the book. And so that was the, the thing that I think everybody started to um, appreciate. Mm -hmm. So no matter what your experience with the book is, you would then see her experience as, as a, an echo of yours mm -hmm. and, and you could understand it or respect it. And, and if you've never read the book, you know, hopefully it would make you curious about the book. Totally. Or you, it's the, then it just becomes a story about somebody being affected by a story. You mm -hmm. know? Which I thought was just such a smart way to make sure that anyone can enjoy this story. Yeah. Uh, you know, as it is. But like you said, you know, and for people like us who who has such attachment to the book can still relate to that as well. And I, I thought it was such a smart choice. Um, it, de it developed over a very long period of time too, mm -hmm. because it was like, there were notions there, there were some ideas there and some very, very vague ideas. And, and when we first started developing the, it was um, Irina Brignall, my writer that came on the project first. I had Chris Applehans, yeah. I had Thurup Van Orman, I had my brother, Kent Osborne, and I had um, Phil Craven even dropped in, if you know Phil, and gave us some advice and gave us, it really gave tremendous advice and helped. Mm -hmm. But th that was sort of the think tank, and we were developing uh, art. These guys were developing art, but mm -hmm. we were also talking story, and you know, we developed about three or four different versions of what the movie could be, what the mm -hmm. larger story could be, and um, eventually Arena went off and wrote a draft of what we ultimately um, kind of built around and, mm -hmm. and came up with, I think, the, the, the structure and the, the bones of what we then developed through the story mm -hmm. process and um, through the rewriting process. And my head of story on the project, Bob Persichetti, he came on as the head of story but ended up being the co-writer on the project because oh, we nice. rewrote so much material yeah. and he was amazing and he really is a writer and it really helped on a day-to-day -day basis for us to develop it. So it, yeah, the, the, the story developed over a very, very long period of time with lots and lots of collaborators. I see. Yeah. What about the decision to kind of bring in stop motion, which is like your forte, like, yeah. and also 3D CG, yeah. which is, you know, definitely you just came out of like, you know, big Kung Fu Panda DreamWorks yeah. CG animation production I like, what was what was the decision and when did you guys decide to kind of do that sort of hybrid um, that was really early because um, you know I was approached they at the producers asked me the French producers who had created a partnership with the estate asked me did I know the book and did I want to make a big CG animated movie and so I said yes, and I said no. <laughs> you know, and I, I really felt like CG wasn't the right medium. And, and, but then the more I thought about it, I thought, okay, this is the opportunity. This is the creative problem to solve. They want it to be CG because they want to be able to go all over the world with this movie. They, want to, they wanted to reach as far as the book has reached, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe farther. That was their goal. So I kind of took that seriously, and that's... Um, but I came back to them and then said, I, I want to use stop motion to protect the book and to yeah. allow for the passages of the book to be done in this other medium and they loved the idea it was one of those big ideas that you know it took a lot of courage and honestly I was throwing it out there never expecting that I would get to do mm. that I had my door I have had many doors uh, shut in my face from talking about stop motion in, in, in Hollywood meetings and this was the first time that it was actually like oh I love that that's great mm -hmm. and they, they could see immediately because it was tied into this larger idea, which was creating a very visual and distinct difference between reality and the world of imagination and the world of the little prince and really letting, you know, um, this really bold, big idea help service the story. That's, yeah, that's one of my favorite part of the story, the, the movie, that the medium, the choice of CG and, yeah. and stop motion made sense for the story. It really helped yeah. the story. Yeah. Uh, that particular stop motion with the paper, yeah. that's kind of, to me, unique 
like you could have done Clemens and you could have done regular puppet and you know uh, more like a Leica type yeah. of yeah. you know stop motion. Why did you go decide to go with that? Well, um, it's it. It, in the beginning, it was just a notion. It was like stop motion, right? Mm -hmm. And that was yeah. that was sort of like the the big hurdle to get over. Once once we were there, though, it was like we started Red Nose Studios, built some models for the pitch, and I and I was looking for an artistic interpretation. I really <clears throat> loved Chris Sickle's work, and I asked him to do some. He did some models early on that were part of the pitch that helped people understand what we were doing. But it wasn't until. Um, you know, I really started looking at Jamie Cleary's work closely. I was a huge fan of his, and he, you know, went to Cal Arts when mm -hmm. I was there. And mm -hmm. Jamie, I've always looked up to him, and you know, I always feel like, you know, he's a real artist, and I'm just like, you know, I'm just like with crayons, you know, <laughs> trying to figure out what I'm doing. And um, you know, so I went to him for advice. He'd, he'd actually give me advice on more. He'd, he'd help mm -hmm. me with with previous stuff and. And I went to him to talk about it, and but we were talking about paper a lot, and mm -hmm. and it was um, just because of the book, yeah. the, the original illustrations, mm -hmm. the handmade quality of the um, the original manuscript pages that Saint Exupéry created. I got to see the originals; oh, yeah. they're very, very artistic and scribbly, and and his handwriting's a mess, and uh -huh. you know, it's like th that inspired me, and it kind of that idea kind of carried through to the the pages that the Aviator has in the movie. They were supposed to look like those original manuscript pages. And then when the girl stares at those pages, she imagines the story and the idea of sort of keeping paper as this follow through was something that that Jamie really, you know, I think took a hold of. And he had had a lot of experience with paper and he had actually just done a music video with um, his partner, uh, Alex Juhas, who designs for him. And they did a music video together for The Shins. Um, called Rifle Spiral and I saw that and it was actually the first time that Jamie had worked with puppets mm -hmm. and they had gone and when I saw that I was like that's this is like the closest bridge to what we need to do and that's mm -hmm. when I, I seriously started engaging Jamie in the conversation of, of coming on and, and helping us realize those sequences mm -hmm. and he's a brilliant director in his own right and I'm really very lucky that you know he w wanted to come and help be a part of this project and um because it was, you know, it's, it was a fairly complex and ambitious project and undertaking. But Jamie was the one, as they started exploring together, um, you know, he was the one that, that said to me, we could do everything in paper. And I never could have imagined mm. that. But they, everything, the clothes on the characters, the scarf, the, the light shines through, it's all this beautiful paper, the sand dunes. Yeah. And, and, and it, and even to the extent, you know, we talked about this creative idea that I wanted it to feel like the little girl's imagination was uh -huh. growing as she was reading the story. She was imagining, you know, better. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. he came back with this idea of starting with everything really flat. So everything was like flat paper planes uh, and, and, and like layers of paper mm -hmm. that would become dimensional when the little prince arrived. Yeah. And yeah. that idea was just pure genius, and I was like so thrilled. And that was something that, um, you know, for him, it was really great because it was, it it was him being able to combine these ideas that he had sort of used before, but mm -hmm. in a new way that mm -hmm. was very, very much rooted in in that experience that the little girl was having. Totally. So it was total storytelling through like visual means and mediums and so at the end of the day we're actually we counted we're four and a half uh animation mediums we're not just two you know we're mm -hmm. four and a half if you count mm -hmm. 2d drawings in the beginning and you count cg and stop motion and then the flat paper stuff right and then right. we have a little bit of 2d on top of cg in a couple places mm -hmm. so that's the half but, ah, yeah wow but but this paper yeah stop motion really captured the poetic nature yeah. of the book yeah and and it, just like you described i was imagining the original kind of manuscript mm. you know yeah. paper like you yeah know, with the actual manuscript uh, for some reason it communicated so well to me like when i watched that it's it was so brilliant i don't think you could capture that with the regular puppet stop motion it was mm. so beautifully done with the paper yeah. um, it was it, really necessary yeah yeah, yeah. it's so brilliant yeah. um i just can't wait 
for at least the you know I know it opened in Japan, it opened in France, and it did so well. But yeah. in, the, in the United States, it, this is the week. Right. So it's on Friday. Mm-hmm. It's the final sort of release of the film. It's going to be、um, available on Netflix, Netflix in both the well, it's the U.S., the U.K., Australia,、mm-hmm. New Zealand. It、okay. goes live. There is some theatrical、um, in New York and Los Angeles, and and some here in San Francisco at the、yeah. Alamo Draft House, my favorite movie theater chain in the whole world. Yeah. And、um, there's actually an Alamo Draft House three miles from my house. And oh I'm living, yeah. Yeah. And so it's like the place I go all the time. So we're going to do a special screening there Sunday night. So there are going to be some opportunity to see it theatrically, but. Um, Netflix has been this amazing partner that's bringing the film to many, many, many more people than I could have ever imagined. And、uh, yeah, the landscape is changing, and with a film like this, that is very unique and and、um, not necessarily what you would expect from animation. I think it 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 it's great to have a partner with Netflix who they do things in a very unique way as well, and they're sort of changing the landscape and. I I just love that they love the film for what it is. They never asked、right. me to change it. They never asked me to. They never wanted to market it in the wrong way.、Right. They wanted to market it for what it was, and they, you know, wrap their head around how to do that. And I'm just really, really excited for sort of their understanding of the film, and、uh, just crazy excited for finally everybody to see it and for the, you know, the long wait to be over. Yeah, totally. Great, Marks. Thank you so much for coming to Tonko House. I know、yeah. you have a very busy schedule. I can't believe you squeezed in your schedule to come and stop by. This was perfect, and I'm really glad I did too. And、uh, yeah, no, it's really, really, really great. And、uh, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much.、Yeah.